Hello and welcome back to another episode of Soccer Supernova, a state of mind's dedicated football chat show with me, Amy Canavan. Today I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by John Robotham, the former Scottish referee. John, thanks so much for joining us. How are you? Yeah, I'm well. I'm well. I'm getting older, but uh, still trying to keep myself reasonably fit, yeah. Not at all, just still a young thing, could easily still be the man in the middle of the park. So we'll, we'll have a little chat about your career and how you're finding, um, taking that step back now and, and seeing the, the standards of refereeing as we see it now. So before we get into that, what, what was your first relationship with football like? How did, um, how did that all come about and, and what made you really go into refereeing? Well, it all started for me a way back when I was about 18, uh, 19 and I played amateur football for a team called Nairn Star in Kirkcaldy. Um, and was pretty much there for a long time until we uh, uh, I moved up to a, a team called the Railway Club again, still in amateur football. Uh, and then when I was about twenty eight, I scored the winning goal in a cup final, uh, an amateur cup final. It was you'll not remember Amy, but it was a Tom for Scythe effort. It was a on the goal line, and I put it in with my studs. Uh, <laughs> And I thought to myself, you know, I could go out at the top here. So I decided that's it. I'm, I, I'm stopping, uh, stopping football altogether. And I came home and I told my wife, I said to my wife, I said, you know, I said, I scored the winning goal in the cup final today. I think that's it. I think I'll retire at the top. My wife said, great, we'll get shopping on a Saturday now. <laughs> I thought, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. Wait a minute. Uh, I, I was thinking about taking up refereeing and that just on the spur of the moment. Uh, and that's where it all started. <laughs> what makes that decision come across when you when you were a player? Did you you know were you a bit of a nuisance to referees, or did you did you always try and like pick little things up from them? Oh no, I was a moaning mini. <laughs> in those days, actually, some of my teammates believe it or not. Uh, I used to have a mass uh, uh, permed curly hair and a huge beard, and uh, I used to be, my mates used to call me the wild man of Borneo. I would just, I would moan about anything. If I lost the toss, it was the referee's fault. <laughs> you know, anything, I, I claim for everything, you know, even though, I'd, even though I'd put the ball out quite clearly, I I claim for the throw and I claim for the, the corner. So, yeah, it was a bit of a moaning mini, I'm afraid. Do you think that helped um, when you made it eventually to, to the top of the game? Do you think you managed to show a little bit of sympathy towards players because you'd been in their shoes, you'd been in their position? I don't know about sympathy to players, but it certainly gave me an experience of what players are going to be like, you know. Um, I thought, well, if they're like that amateur, they can only be maybe a bit more kind uh, at senior level, only to find out that uh, that was a miscomprehension on my part, you know. Um, but yeah, it gave me an understanding of the game, definitely. When you were... Um... When you get right in it, I think you hear a lot of people talk about it now, and we'll, we'll definitely come on to that, the sort of, you know, relationship that fans have with referees and, and the stick they give. But it's not so much just, you know, getting your badges and getting flung in right at the top. You, you've really got to put the years in and work your way up, don't you? Well, yeah, and, and even more so now. I mean, as I say, I was late on the scene. Um, at that time, at 28 and 29, you still had that uh, possibility of reaching the top if you could. Although I didn't realise at the time because it was just a hobby, really, to get them out and going shopping initially. Um, but nowadays, the referees are, are so young uh, and they're, they're nurtured. You know, they're nurtured, there's development and, and they're nurtured so much more than, than we were. Um, so because I came on late to the scene, uh, I didn't expect to get what I eventually got, no. Do you think um, in, in those early days, you, you were maybe a little bit naive to, to how tricky it would possibly be? You know, like you say, you, you come in from the playing side of things, it was originally a hobby, and then as you start to, to move on and it becomes more serious and it does become, you know, a, a job, you, you maybe didn't perhaps appreciate how, how difficult it was going to be. Yeah, yeah, right. I, I didn't appreciate um, from the going on the, um, my first game at, uh, under 18 level, um, as a hobby, to then progress and somebody coming up and saying, listen, I'd like to, to join the amateur ranks, uh, uh, you know, you've got a bit of potential, still thinking it's a hobby, um, to then becoming a, a junior referee, and I'm thinking, at that point, I start to think, wait a minute, this is this is actually, this is a, a, a wee sort of sideline here, this is good. And then, to get onto the official list as a, a well, assistant referee, it was a linesman, as I called it, but that's when it started. That's when it started to sink in. That's when it started to go, wait a minute. Uh, I'm on the official SFA list here. Uh, I'm running the line. Um, 
there might be something here. Still not expecting to go as far as I did. So yeah, it, it, it sinks in once you go onto that list. So when when you're on that list, what can you remember your your first game? You know your your first professional game, the first game in the, the back then it'd been the SPL. Can, can you still remember those games? Yeah, my first my first game, my first game uh, on the line was at um at, at that level was at East Stirling, um East Stirling and Albion Rovers. Um, Eric Martindale was in the middle, and Hugh Dallas was the senior linesman that day. Um, and and it was quite an eye opener because even in those days, I mean, East Stirling had a few hundred, um, and I was on the uh, I was the, the sort of the junior linesman as it were. So I had the crowd behind me, uh, and well, some of the things you know that were shouting were, were unrepeatable. But I remember that day, um, Hugh Dallas <laughs> Hugh Dallas went to flag someone offside, and threw his flag up in the air and caught it when it came down, and somebody said, "See." I knew the guys were orange men. I knew they did the march, you know. And and at the time, I'm from the east, and I didn't really sort of sink in what what they were going on about. But as the years progressed, I realised what that meant. But that was my first ever game on the line at East Stirling. Did you um, when you're on the line? Do you then have that even greater ambition, like you say, to to get to that man in the middle? What's the relationship like? Oh, it's great. I mean, it's a team. Um, in our day, we wanted to go out and a, not have anybody talking about us, um, but uh, covering each other's backs, um, you know, where, where we could. Um, it, it was it was fascinating, even just at that level, to see how different it was from amateur and junior level, just stepping up into the, uh, which was the Scottish Second Division at that time, um, at a small ground. It was still a, quite an eye-opener as to how things work and you realise it's a different kind of pressure, even at that level, to... Because obviously, I, 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 most of the time, I had been in the middle. I had done a line at uh, reserve games. We used to have reserve football and that. But it's different from being on the line to being in the middle. And I, I think there's more pressure <laughs> being an assistant referee, stroke linesman, what there is a referee. Do you think that's because of the fans on your back? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I know as a referee, you're making the decision, you know, in the long run, but you have, especially as you go up the grades, you've got all these fans behind you. Um, you know, there's pressure on you. you. There's no space between you and, and the fans. But as a referee, you're in the middle. You can, you've got the, the pressure off the players and you've got the pressure of making the decision, but you don't have the same pressure. I think that an assistant referee's got with all these people and I think it's quite a hard job being a, uh, an assistant if you think offside in that nowadays is is crazy. And even in those days, you know, offside's a really difficult thing to, to latch on to. And as a referee, I just felt less pressure as a referee than what I did as an analyzer. You're talking about the fans there and, you know, you listen to players and they'll talk about that when they play at certain grounds, it's because, it's because of the fans make it. It has to have that same sort of impact on a referee, you know. If it be a big game for a player, it's going to be the exact same sort of big occasion for a referee, isn't it? Oh, massive. Massive. A big game. I used to, when I eventually got to sort of being the main man in the middle, um, I really, I, I never really thought about where I was. I just, I had two teams who needed me to do the best that I could and, and my two assistants to do the best that we could. Uh, but the pressure's there and obviously... The bigger the crowd, the more noise, the, the bigger the pressure, the bigger the game as you go up the, the list, you know, from second division, first division, uh, SPL, European. And, and yeah, the pressure does mount up, but at the same time, um, it's, a, it's a pressure that you know is going to be there and it's a pressure that you live with. And, and if you didn't do it, you just wouldn't be, you wouldn't be in it, you know? You're talking about there that... Um you didn't really think of where you were or because all that mattered was, was obviously the two teams needed you to, to do your best. Yeah. Do, do you have a, a favourite ground? You know, like you, see, you hear players talk about oh, the Celtic Park or, or Anfield or whatever. Did, did you have a favourite ground over the years? Well, do you know, yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, obviously the, the, the larger stadiums, you know, um, Parkhead, Ibrox, you know, and I used to like, I used to love refereeing in Dundee United for some reason. I just found it a nice, a nice compact ground, but all the grounds had something about them. Um, the the larger crowds, the bigger stadium was great, but the smaller grounds, you know, East Stirling, Albion Rovers, uh, uh, Stennis Muir. I mean, Stennis Muir, I, I love refereeing at Stennis Muir, not because it was a particularly fantastic stadium, 
But if you did a midweek game there and the toffee factory was right behind it, the smell of toffee when you were running about that park was fantastic. You know, and, and, and if the game was a nightmare, you, you could almost let your imagination run away as to, you know, what were they making, the chocolate Highland toffee or was it just the Highland? And it was great. The smell used to be fantastic. So I love going to Stennismuir. I didn't like it when it was old ground because <laughs> at Stennismuir's old ground, um, the shouting system wasn't, wasn't brilliant. Uh, and the changing rooms, before they got the new changing rooms, it was one bath in the referee's changing room. So if you've got a referee, two linesmen, he came at the end of the game and the grounder had very kindly filled the bath up with hot water. But there was only enough hot water left for one bath. So the referee got in first being the most senior man. The most senior assistant then got in to the sort of half mucky water to have his bath. And if you really felt like it was a junior linesman, you got what was left of the dirty water. So needless to say, I didn't bath much when I left Stennis New, but the smell was great. The smell of the toffee was fantastic. That, that that they're the memories, aren't they? That you know, they're, they're the little bits that yeah. I I, I talked to to a lot of the top pros, and it's not until they, they go into you know management or whatever. I was speaking to David Robertson, and he was like, when he went to to Montrose, it's it's those little communities that that actually make football in in Scotland, don't they? Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. Um, you know, all, all the the. You know, and they'll forgive me for saying the smaller clubs, uh, Berwick Rangers, Albion Rovers, obviously Berwick Rangers now out of the league, but uh, all the smaller grounds, these people were diehards. You have to remember, these people were going to watch teams that weren't brilliant and, and regularly got beat, but they turned up. They turned up every Saturday to see their team. Uh, and the beauty of being at these small grounds is you heard every comment. In the big grounds, it was just a, a, a noise, and you thought, oh, they're not happy with what I've done there. And in the small grounds, you know, you got all kinds of advice there, where to put your flag, you know, what to do with your guide dog, uh, and all they kind. And you heard them all, but the atmosphere in them was great. It was great. Uh, I really enjoyed going to some of the smaller grounds as well. The atmosphere was, was really good, a different kind of atmosphere, but good. Absolutely. And as a referee, you see, you eventually, you did make it to the very top and, and you were the main man. What What is your connection like with the fans? You know, do, do you get recognised in the streets? Because as you see, you, you are a very noticeable fella. And if you're the middle man officiating, you know, Celtic at the weekend, if you can notice you on a Saturday, you're going to be able to recognise you on a Monday, surely. Absolutely. I mean, I always said, <laughs> I always said that the, 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 bald, the bald head, wasn't really it didn't really hold me back in football um it kind of got you know had i been just a tall guy with dark hair uh, i might have just been like every other referee but it was different at that time it was different because if you watch them now i always said that i think the way to make a referee is to shave your head and if you look at the amount of bald referees now it's amazing i think they've latched on to it uh, like some bobby madden and all they've all latched on to this get your head shaved uh, and, and you're on your way but it was good, and I always felt it was good, Amy, because being in the east of Scotland, I didn't feel the same prep. Like when you go out and you get recognised in a restaurant, um, it was easier than, I think, for the guys through the west, um, going out into Glasgow and places like that where they might get recognised. And there's obviously a lot more Rangers, Celtic, and, and other clubs out that way. So I think it may be more difficult for them going out. But I didn't mind. I used to get good banter with the fans when I was out. Uh, as well and yeah it might have been because at that time Kalina the Italian referee was coming through uh, or already broken through in Italy when I was uh, going on the list so uh, yeah it was it, it was it was more it helped me more I think uh, as a referee and what it, it hindered me. You know there's there's a talk quite a lot you, you mentioned there obviously you're through the east and and as am I there's um there's quite a, a well-known but it's quite a secret they try to keep it hidden that, that there's that divide, you know, in Scottish football, the east to the west, there's a different in, in clubs and, and officiating. Were you aware of that divide in Scotland? Um, more so through the west. Um, the, the big derby games through in the east, Hibs Hearts and uh, Aberdeen Dundee United at that time, I mean, they were they were hard-fought games. It meant a lot to these teams, but there was a just a different kind of atmosphere, um, particularly in, in, obviously in the old firm game. Um, that than what there was uh, through the east, I just it just felt it just felt different. I, I can't actually put my finger what felt different. It just not that it wasn't any more passionate through the east. There was just a different atmosphere 
uh, when you were going to, to that kind of game, the old firm game through in the West. Right, so you officiated 13 um, old firm games. What were those occasions like for you? Amazing. I, I see in my after dinner stuff that, uh, yeah, it was 13, um, 11 of which were fourth official and two were referees. So I said I was either a really good fourth official or a rubbish referee. So you could, you could, but uh, 13, everyone full of passion, full of passion. Um, from minute one to minute 90, it, it could be drifting along for 20 minutes and you think you're in control. And then it just goes one incident, one tackle. A, a goal, just something. The whole atmosphere would change. Obviously, I was, I was with Hugh that day that he got uh, hit by the coin uh, at the Rangers Celtic game. Now, I have never felt an atmosphere like that in my life. It was incredible, um, because virtually Rangers win that day and they've won the league. And the whole atmosphere, the whole day from start to finish, from uh, standing in the tunnel, uh, walking out. Um, and it was funny, there was a Rangers player, it's maybe no, better not mention his name, but as you walk out the tunnel at Celtic Park, they have a, I don't know if they still have it, they had a big, um, it was like a, a rug with a Celtic crest and everything on it. And the Rangers players were walking out, and I was fourth official one day, and I was walking out behind the two teams, obviously. And there was a Rangers player who wouldn't walk on that mat, he actually walked around it, stepped up onto the dugout wall and stepped back down again, and I thought, that opened my eyes. I thought, wow, is that is that what some people feel? You know, that they won't even walk on that on that rug. So that kind of surprised me. But the atmosphere of that day with Hugh, from him getting hit with a coin, the possibilities of me going on because he was injured, he couldn't continue. Um, the guy who allegedly fell uh, off the stand... Uh, the, the coins after it, when the Rangers players went to the corner to celebrate, uh, the coins coming down to hit them, to being in the dressing room after it, having to do a match report, making sure Hugh's okay, because at half time he had to get a stitch on his eye. And I'm thinking to myself, is this really, is it, you know, I couldn't can, I can take it all in. I couldn't take it all in. I came home that night and uh, just sat down. I felt physically drained. And I was only the fourth official that day. So, you know, how Hugh and that felt. And, and, but all the, every one of these, Celtic Rangers game have something in them that you just never know what's what's going to happen. I, I remember my first Rangers Celtic game was at, was at Parkhead as a referee and I bought myself new boots and everything. Worst thing I could have ever done because it was wet that day and I fell on my backside twice. Twice I fell on my backside. Once I went to give a fell to Celtic right outside the box. I run in to, to let them see where they're getting a fell. Fell flat on my backside and, and looked up and there was uh, Big Van Hoydonk looking at me as so I was an idiot. You know, I'm lying on my back, legs in the air. I'm thinking the cameras are on me. God, you know, my first game. But it just it just got you. You just buzzed all the time. You, you talk about the atmosphere and, and as do the players. How do you as a referee maintain your concentration during that? You know, it's a, it's a total and utter cauldron if it be Parkhead or Ibrox or, yeah. or Hamden, wherever it may yeah. be. But how do you maintain your concentration? Um, I found it really easy. I found it really easy because you were so hyped. You, uh, you know, you were so. People say, "Were well, you nervous?" Yeah, I was kind of nervous, but at the same time, it was a, a, a an excited nervous. Um, but when you go into the park, it's a green space with twenty two players, and you're focused. You're focused a hundred percent on 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 what's going on. In fact, that was really the same everywhere. You just focused on what was going on in the park. And uh, if at any time you did let your focus drift or your concentration drift, that's when you had problems. You you did lose the game. You, you lost your place. You, you started making mistakes. And it was so important to keep that, that 100% concentration from minute one to minute 90. It was so easy for 80 minutes for the game to be going great. And you think, yeah, I've got this one in my pocket. Then something happens. And for the last 10 minutes, it's mayhem. And then that's what you remember for that last 10 minutes of mayhem. Absolutely. You are, you, you really are remembered, obviously, like mm -hmm. you say, and not just not just you, sorry, just in, referees in general, you're always remembered for, for your mistakes. Um, yeah. and, and that's what that's what gets picked up on. So if you make if you make a mistake during the game, or obviously hindsight is a wonderful thing. So if you, you, you take the gas going incident, sending gas yeah. going off, does that play on your mind for the remainder of the game? And how, how do you then, like you say, how do you continue? Because you, you are aware, obviously, 
you, you have maybe made the wrong decision. Well, nine, I'll say 99% of the time, and you make that decision, you don't think you made the wrong decision. Yeah. Um, that incident, that incident with, with, with Paul that night uh, at Parkhead, uh, I felt, I mean, geez, what, I, uh, it, was one of these, it was one of these Ranger Celtic games that was just, it was oh, hell for leather the whole game. And, and when I sent him off, I, 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 I never for one minute, I can honestly say not for one minute did I think I got you back for that. Because people say to me, ah, you were trying to get him back for the Rangers Aberdeen game. And I say, no, I wasn't trying to get him back. It was what I saw at the time, and I gave it at the time. And I never thought any more of it during the game or who I'd sent off or anything. I was just concentrating on the game fully. It's only after it you can look back and say, um, did I make a mistake? So watch it on the television. Did I make a mistake? I'm not sure. If you let the mistake affect you at the time, one mistake leads to another mistake, and then it's it's a, your whole game goes goes to pieces. You know. So, And referees are human, and sometimes that does happen where they make a mistake, and... Um, then they seem to make another mistake after it, and then it doesn't seem to, it doesn't matter what you do, you, you never seem to make the right decision after that, and it's just one of these things you have to accept. You're you're having a bad game, you're not happy about it, but you're having a bad game, you make mistakes, and the worst thing you could do is never admit you made mistakes because uh, you'd be kidding yourself if you didn't. Just as as you touched on that there, I think it's it's a decent time to to bring in what is your sort of views with VAR? You know, like you say, referees are only human. Mm-hmm. Do you think you'd have you'd have benefited from having VR, or do you think it could have hindered you? I think it's I think it's still in the melting pot. To be honest, with you. if I was giving you an honest opinion, I um, I I initially thought if it if it's for ball being over the line, um, which is a fact, um, penalty kicks, which are really still matters of opinion, um, you know, was it a penalty? Was it not? I thought well. We have to try it. You know, we have to move forward. Uh, the whole world's moving forward. Uh, let's let's help referees. Um, the problems that it's caused, particularly down in England, because obviously in Scotland we don't have it to the same effect. The problems it's causing in England, uh, I find incredible. Uh, I find incredible where it's where they've taken it to. Um, I've watched quite a few English games. Um, I've watched the player pointing to where he wants the ball put. They put it through. He scores a goal. Then. They look at it in VR and his hand that was pointing to where he was wanting the ball put is offside. Uh, and there's somebody's foot was offside, somebody's knee was offside. And I think, is that really offside? Yeah, technically, I suppose it is, but is that really what the game wants to see? And I feel it's it, it's it's not really making the game flow. I've seen games where I think was it last year, was it Burnley and Bournemouth where I think there was a penalty incident in one box, the referee didn't give it, went up the park. The team scored at the other end. The referee gets word he has to go back. Two minutes later, there's a penalty back down, and that goal's been disallowed. And I think to myself, they're really putting referees under pressure now. Uh, and I think the jury's still out on whether it's the best thing for the game or not. How much it's getting involved in the game, how much it's taking over the game, and I don't think that was the idea of VAR in the first place. But I think time will tell. I don't think we're going to go back to not having it. Um, but I may be proved wrong. You, you said earlier, obviously, you, you've been a, a linesman or assistant mm. referee, what, whatever you want to call it, for yeah. for a number of games. And you, you said yourself, you know, offside's tricky, but you see all these crazy lines being drawn in, especially down south, and, you know, like you say, the fingertip, or if, if, if the player's not cut his toenails, like, it's taking that human touch out of the game, isn't it? Oh, definitely. I mean, I know within the law, I suppose they're offside. Are they really offside? The fact that the guy pointed, I think it was Patrick Bamford that leads on, he pointed to where he wanted the ball put. The guy put it through him. He goes through, he scores a great goal. And the VR look at it, and as you say, they draw this imaginary line across. And even when they draw the imaginary line across, and you think, is that, is that tip? Is he really offside? And I really don't think that's helping the game at all. I think that's uh, I think that's taking it to the extreme where somebody's fingertips, somebody's knee, somebody's toe. Um, I I just don't see how that's benefiting the flow of the game at all. Um, I know you have to get the decisions right, but I mean they really have to be consistent, which they're not either. I watched the English Cup final, and I think there was some Dubai as to whether Leicester City there was a handball in the lead up, and they didn't look at it and. Lest, uh, Chelsea said, well, why didn't they look at it? It's VR. That's what VR's for. And then they got a goal disallowed because I think Chidwell's knee was was 
was offside and and really you know and then you see the player celebrating the fans are celebrating 15 seconds later the referee's standing waiting in his ear to see if it was a goal or not the fans are still celebrating the players have gone daft they're making their way back to the halfway line all of a sudden the referee's going down and saying it's offside uh, I don't see it helping the game that way no Taking it into account then, do you, obviously there's there's no doubt you, you'll you'll sh- you'll share sympathy with referees because it's it's not a position that, that you'd want to be in, but do you think you maybe you caught refereeing at a decent time, you, you never had that, like you say, there's nothing worse that you watch fans, which is great to see fans back in, they celebrate a goal, like you say, in the, in the cup final, you see Chelsea fans celebrating and then 15 seconds later it's all taken away, do you think mm. you, you got refereeing at the right time? Yeah, we had... Uh, I think I think Sky used to have something like 32 cameras at um, a Celtic Rangers game, um, but even in those days, the, the offsides when the when they replayed it, there was still a great deal of Dubai uh, of whether the assistant referee, linesman, whatever you want to call them, had got it right, or if the referee had got a penalty incident right. Um, there was always that there was debate. There was debate. Um, uh, on television, the pundits they, they were able to debate it, and there was a lot of times they weren't sure. Some some would say, "Well, yeah, there was contact there, but I don't know if it should have been a penalty." Uh, so there was there was debate, and and I think we got it at the time because a lot of the time they gave us the benefit of doubt. Nowadays, that there's there's debate of a different kind, you know, um, because they've got this VAR, and um, the pundits are able to look at it. And even the pundits sometimes don't agree with the VAR decision. It's not even clear that the referee has, has made, a, and I know it has to be a clear and obvious error, but some of the decisions that have been overturned, quite frankly, have, have amazed me. Uh, you, you're, you're spot on. And like I say, I think everybody kind of shares those sort of views and, and who knows where exactly it'll take. Because you mentioned there, obviously, you know, old firm games and, and we spoke about some, some big clubs down south and, and the FA Cup. You, you made it obviously to the, the top of the list in, in the SFA and in, in the Scottish game, but then you, you made that stretch in the European games as well. What was it like when, when you go out and, and you say represent Scotland and, and officiate in these European matches? It's amazing. Um, I actually got, um, I knew I'd been nominated by the SFA to go um, to become a FIFA referee. Um, and I actually got confirmation a couple of days after Christmas uh, of 1995, so it was a great, you know, it was a great time to get the best, best Christmas present I think I've ever had. Um, but going to Europe, I mean, it was absolutely, I absolutely loved it. I found no disrespect to the Scottish game and to the players here, but because they didn't know yet in Europe, you were able to control the game quicker because they didn't know your style of refereeing. There was a different respect, and believe you me, the Scottish referees abroad get tremendous respect from. Uh, teams from countries when you go abroad and referee uh, and when you go abroad you're going abroad to represent your country I mean you're going abroad to represent Scotland not just yourself, the SFA you're with your colleagues you're all going out to represent uh, represent Scotland it's absolutely fantastic, it's a great feeling it's a real proud moment from the first game that you ever do to the last game you ever do it's just pride every time who were some of the best players you, you shared a pitch with? Well, in my day, in my day, my uh, well, one of one of my my big ambitions, I'd always want to go to the San Siro. Uh, you know, when I was playing football, I, there was something about AC Milan that I, I loved, and uh, I went away with Les Mortram as a fourth official to a European Cup semi final, uh, AC Milan against Paris Saint Germain. Um, and it was just amazing. Um, you know, some of the... Franco Baresi, I thought, was one of the greatest defenders I'd ever seen. And to be sharing pitch with the likes of that and uh, Ruud Hulet, Van Basten, Jean-Pierre Papa, um, it, it was just a, a surreal moment. Um, I was a, a wee boy for Kirkcaldy and I was, I was out sharing a pitch um, with, with guys like that. And it was just uh, the old Ronaldo... I don't wish to be disrespectful. I'm fat Ronaldo. Um, when, one of my first ever my first ever ventures into Europe was the Toulon Under Twenty One tournament down in the south of France. Um, there was four or five different referees from a different country went to that, and Scotland had a team. It was the likes of Davy Hanna, and all, that was the, the guys that were playing for Scotland in those days. 
And I was down in the south of France, um, Brazil, Brazil were there. Um, Roberto Carlos, big Ronaldo, and, I, and it was just incredible. I'm thinking I'm in too long with these guys, uh, not knowing at that time where they were going to be. Um, and big Ronaldo, um, I had to, that I'd got sent to Russia with Hugh Dallas, uh, Spartak Moscow versus Inter Milan when Ronaldo went to Inter Milan, and I. I was standing in the tunnel, he was at the back, and I thought, I wonder if he speaks much English. So I said to him, ah, Ronaldo, and he goes, ah, yeah. And that's what he said to me, and I thought he understood me. I says, ah, uh, John Rotham, you remember uh, um, Toulon, you, me. And he went, you, me, Toulon? And I went, yeah, you remember? He goes, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I'm up here thinking, oh, this guy remembers me from Toulon. <laughs> And to, but I mean, to, to have guys like, you know, to share a pitch with guys like even Ronaldo towards the end of his career, although I was the fourth man, I was still in the tunnel with these guys surrounding you. Fantastic. Even, not even in Europe, Wraith Rovers, uh, when they, they'd done so well in Europe against Bayern, and then Bayern came here to um, play a friendly um, in respect of what, what happened with Wraith Rovers. And at that time, it was Jurgen Klinsmann. Uh, wow. All those those kind of guys, uh, it was just amazing that you know Oliver Bierhoff, who was a real good player, uh, a good German international. These were all guys. Uh, Matthias, you know, it was just unbelievable. The the guys that you're thinking, wow. I mean, I know a lot of young people won't recognise these names, but for me at that time, he's that a was, legend. Wow, you know, uh, you know, it, it, it was. It was. There were there were legends. They were absolute legends. Uh, I met um, Ruud Hulett when he was with it. Manager in Newcastle. Newcastle came up to play a friend at Livingston. Uh, and Ruud Hulett remembered me from uh, those days, even though I wasn't refereeing. I was, again, I was the fourth official. Um, but what an honour that is for somebody like that. When you go in to check the studs and he, he puts his hand out to shake your hand because he remembers you from... And wow, you know, you're thinking, is this really happening to me? You know, I, I'm a wee lad for Kirkcaldy who took this up as a hobby and I'm rubbing shoulders with, with these kind of players. Fantastic. Well, worth not making it just out to be a hobby, though, eh? Oh, definitely. Definitely. And then, obviously, domestically. Domestically, Rangers and Celtic and that brought over some fantastic players. Um, you know, two, I mean, two that stood out for me. Henrik Larsson, who, who I had refereed... Um, I think it was Helsingborg he was, he was at, and uh, I refereed them in Ferns Varis in a, a European game. At that time, an average player comes to Celtic, fantastic player. Brian Loudrop, absolutely superb. Uh, and these were top class names, you know. You see where Henrik went, you know, Barcelona, Man United. Just fantastic, fantastic. You mentioned it there as well. Um those European adventures, but and you you got that a little bit further as well with the international stage. What's it like an international match compared to, to a domestic match? Um, I think you realise you realise it's an international match, and it's still eleven against eleven. Um, but I said to you earlier on about the pride of representing Scotland. You saw the pride of these players representing their country. You know they were. It was fantastic. I went to like, simple little places like Licht I would have never went to Liechtenstein on holiday and I went to do Liechtenstein versus Austria. And Mike McCurry was my fourth man. And you know they play the national anthems in that um, before the game. So they played the Austrian national anthem and then they started playing the UK national anthem. And I turned to Mike and I says, wow, Mike, I says, that's the first time ever that I've known that they play the national anthem of the officials. And Mike said, yeah, it's brilliant. Very man, he said, we believe that. So the music stopped and the teams broke away and I thought, wait a minute, what about the home? It was only then that I realised that the actual Liechtenstein national anthem is the same tune as ours, but I think they say God Save the King. Really? Um, yeah, yeah, it's the same national anthem. It's the same tune. It's the same tune that we have. Uh, and I was thinking that they were playing it for us, but they were obviously it was it was their own it was their own national team that they were playing for. Um, it, it was doing international games were fantastic. I did Cyprus and Bulgaria without realizing that 
because of history and, and what goes on, that apparently that's like a Ranger Celtic game. Um, and the atmosphere was unbelievable. A, sm a smallish crowd. Um, the Bulgarian, Bul Bulgaria went a goal up early on. Uh, and I remember the Bulgarian guy who scored the goal run behind the goals. And you know how you're supposed to, if, if the nowadays, if they, if they jump into the crowd and they need to give a caution or whatever it is, you know. Uh, I remember the Bulgarian guy running behind the crowd and I thought, wait a minute, pal, you're going to the Cyprus fans. That might not be the best idea. And then all of a sudden, there was this, there was a, it was like a rain shower of plastic Coca-Cola bottles came raining down to the stand to this guy from Bulgaria where he just stopped and he turned, but by this time I had caught him up. And as he turned, he had this look of horror on his face because I'm standing behind him with a yellow card in my hand to show me the yellow card for going, being so stupid. But the look on his face was priceless. Um, but it was after the game, I was told that um, because of what's happened in history, etc., etc., I didn't ask too much about it, but um, it was like a Ranger Celtic game. It was a tough old game, a real tough game. And that was internationally, you know, so um, you just never knew what the internationals were going to throw up. But there was a pride, a real pride, you know, in the teams and you could see it. You see, it is all about pride, and then, it, it, sadly, it, it turned out to obviously to be your final game as well. But you're the main man, the middle man for the the Scottish Cup, um, the Scottish Cup final, and yeah. there, there has to be an immense pride in that. Oh, it's the despite all the European stuff and, and everything else, the be all and end all for me would be to was to referee a national cup final. I had done two as fourth official up to that point. And I thought me always going to be the sort of bridesmaid and never, you know, and I thought, is it always going to be like that? And then to get that phone call, um, because in fairness, it wasn't just, well, I'm hoping it wasn't just because it was my last season, but I'd had a really good season that year. Um, I don't know if, it, do you know, Amy, I felt as though the pressure was completely off because it was my last season. I, I used to try and think I refereed with a bit of freedom, but for some reason that season, I just felt as though I was refereeing with complete and utter freedom. And to get the call from Drew Herbertson at the SFA to say that I've been selected, uh, I mean, I think I, I think I was quoted as saying I was uh, I was walking in space for days, you know, and it just all of a sudden to think that my last ever game is going to be at the, a the National Stadium and be the Scottish Cup final, and to share the stage uh, with Ricky Mooney and Andy Davis, who were my two assistants, and most importantly as well, Willie Young, and it was Willie Young's last game um, as a as a referee as well. Um, it was just such an honour walking out, knowing that there was uh, some of my family were in the stand, and what a way to finish a career, um, you know, to do your national cup final. It was just amazing. I was buzzing. You put in a stellar performance as well, so that has to aid to it. But you knew it was your final season because obviously there is that cap that once you reach once you reach an age, sorry. Do you think that that's perhaps? still perhaps wrong you know you look at when, when cleaner retired he was still at the peak and he was still at the best do you think it's there, there doesn't need to be that sort of barrier that age or do you think it could even be you know heightened it could be you could be a little, little bit older well at the time to be completely selfish i was as fit as i'd been when i was 40. uh you know i, I at training i was still as fit and my mind was still sharp enough that i could have felt uh, that i could have went on refereeing and in those days, I used to think, oh, why did I have to make an age limit? Um, then when I stood back from it, I realised that, so if me and Kalina go on forever, and Willie Young goes on forever, and Hugh Dallas goes on forever, how do the young boys develop? Um, how do you develop young referees to, I mean, how long are they going to have to wait? Are they going to be 35, 40, 45 before they get a chance? And I, I think I realised that when I took away the selfish outlook, you have to have a production line of referees. Referees can't be there forever. You just have to hope that the newer group of referees can feed off maybe what's happened uh, to guys like uh, Hugh Dallas, Willie Young, myself, boys like Kalina, uh, feed off the enthusiasm that we had. And I think when I stood back and looked at it, I realised that although I could have went on for years, um, it, it, it was a nice way to go out and maybe to make way for some younger referees and, and to give somebody else the chance um, because there's only a limited amount of people who, who make that class one and who make that uh, UEFA uh, FIFA international referee. 
he can't stay there forever. Uh, time has to move on. Um, so once I'd settled down and got used to not being a referee, which took me years, because I went back to doing amateur football for a while just to keep myself involved, I realised that uh, we had to stand aside and let some younger referees come through and have a go. You see, that, that younger plethora did come through. And to be honest, a, a lot of them are still there. Do you think, to be honest, you kind of hit the nail on the head. It's such a small select that are that class one, band one, and the, the top grade in Scotland. Do you think they get an unfair amount of stick, perhaps, because it is just, you know, maybe the same five, six refs just on repeat at the top? Oh, <laughs> I'm speaking from my side of the events. I think the referees always get a raw deal. It ain't the easiest job in the world. Referees don't always get it right. Um, football is all about opinions. It's all about angles, how you see a, how you see an incident, how you see a penalty. Um, it's all about a split decision. You don't have replays. You make it as you see it. Um, so, yeah, I always feel that referees get a raw deal, but I can understand. I'm also a football supporter. I've been since I stopped refereeing. And before I refereed, I'm still one of these fans that used to stand on the terrace and and give the referee dog's abuse because he hasn't given a foul my team's way or uh, I'm not happy with his performance. Um, but he, he, it's just one of these things as a referee, you know you know it's going to happen. And, and it might seem a simple thing to say, but I always feel if you can't stand the heat, you have to get out the kitchen. Um, you know it's coming. You ain't going to be popular. Policemen are not popular. Traffic wardens are not popular. Referees are not popular all the time. Um, so they do get stick, but it comes with the territory, I'm afraid. And uh, the best ones will be able to take that on their back and run with it. Uh, and the ones that can't take it uh, will find that they might not make it to the top level, um, but they will get so far up the ladder. So I'm always going to say referees get too much stick, yeah. <laughs> Can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. I love that. John, I, I've thoroughly enjoyed our chat. Um, th thank you so much for joining me. Um, I'm delighted to see, uh, you see you're still doing well. I think we touched on it before we came on air. You've had both your, your vaccinations. Yep. Everything Everything's going well with your life right now, isn't it? It is, yep. Uh, I've, uh, <laughs> since I stopped, uh, since this lockdown, uh, I've started, uh, believe it or not, I never baked a cake in my life, so I've started baking. And I've... Uh, I've always wanted to speak a language. I'm doing very basic French, uh, so I've now got the time to do it. And uh, yeah, life's just uh, going along nicely just now. You can go back to the Toulon tournament. Well, I, I would love to go. I'd love to go. Do you know something? If somebody said to me tomorrow, uh, we want you a referee next season, uh, it would probably take me half a season to get myself back to fitness. But I would, I would jump back into it in a flash I would recommend it to any young person who's thinking about taking up refereeing it's not just a hobby anymore it's become a career so go for it I'll, I loved it well if the SFA are in need they know to give you a call John if Robotham they're <laughs> if they're stuck thank you so much for joining me on Soccer Supernova you're welcome anyway. thanks very much for having me thank you